Hello, Raylene Nuanis, whose information is down below in the description box, people. Thank you so much, everyone who is just now uh, joining our channel. Welcome, welcome. We have, of course, the wonderful Raylene and my son, Eric, who are going to top uh, tackle a very difficult uh, topic, and that is painkillers and the opioid epidemic and the entire Sackler family, the Purdue family. We're going to interview them in the afterlife. So let me give you a little bit of background. Arthur Mortimer and Raymond Sackler founded and owned the pharmaceutical company Pardue Pharma, whose main drug is Oxycontin and opioid, and one that has caused a lot of trouble. Since 1999, 200,000 Americans have died from overdoses related to Oxycontin and other prescription opioids. Many addicts finding prescription payment uh, kill killers too expensive or too difficult to attain have turned to heroin. According to the AMA, no, I'm sorry, no, the American Society of Addiction Medicine, four out of five people who try heroin today start with prescription painkillers like Oxycontin. The most recent figures from Centers of Disease uh, Control and Prevention suggest that 145 Americans now die every day from opioid overdoses. So thank you, Eric. I love you. And thank you for helping us navigate this very difficult topic. Says you're welcome, Mom. I love you very much. Hello. Hey, saying hello to everybody and and everybody. Let's get ready for this topic. Yeah. Brace yourself. All right. Let's go through the questions that were uh, gathered from our wonderful community who always has just the best questions. I just am uh, so in awe of them. First, was your agenda, Sackler family, what was your agenda when making and supplying these drugs? And Eric, if you can't get them, any of them, um, you know, you can answer that for us. Money. Money was the agenda. It was being able to live a very lavish lifestyle and bring in a different type of income that would not be able to be made elsewhere. Um, even through food business, through farming, there was no other resort to bringing in this type of lavish lifestyle that they, yeah. they desired. Um, it wasn't intended to bring on the crisis that is now presented yeah. with the world. Okay. Um, so Eric or Sackler family, who should we have as our spokesperson, Arthur Mortimer or Raymond Sackler? Or do you, do they want to divide it up? Divide it. Okay. So were you guys part of a secret society or elite group? No, not a secret society, but a higher up society. Like just social status, you know, social, social economic elite? Yes. Okay. Did you know from the beginning that opioids would be extremely addicted, addicting and one day cause an epidemic? Addicting, yes. Epidemic, no. Okay. He's... um. He's referring to alcohol being very addictive and people needing to learn their boundaries when it comes to consuming that. They were under the same assumption that people would have to have boundaries with consuming opiates. Um, that's that was, not the way that it went. Yeah. It was more addictive, I guess, than the thought. Yeah. Okay. Was yeah. it intent that ph pharmaceuticals would be peddled to the masses via the constant pill pushing ads to which people are now exposed or were your intentions different, like even altruistic? Arthur is the one that's speaking right now. It was intended for pharmaceutical companies to overtake. Yeah. Okay. So did you have any pure intentions? Like we want to help people in pain? Yes, but well, most of my intentions were money. Yeah. He knew that his product was a good product and it would help people that were suffering. He also knew that it had pros and cons, such as being hard to get off of withdrawals. There, there was an, an there was a lot of awareness over 
over the symptoms that were going to be caused by coming off of the medication, mm -hmm. the withdrawals, and over the symptoms that would be caused to help people that were suffering from pain. Um, he's talking about the brain and the, the hemispheres that it operates off of. Mm -hmm. uh, dopamine and serotonin were something that were really pushed through with this medication. And so he says he was aware of possible consequences, but not to the extent of opioid, cri opioid crisis. Do you think that if you knew, hindsight is twenty twenty, that it would have caused the deaths that, that it has caused, that you would have done something differently, or would you have just done exactly what you did? You wouldn't have done anything differently because it was in the hands of the pharmacy, big pharma, and not only him, although he was the, the, the creator, mm -hmm. he is not the one that distributed it in the way that okay. pharmacies did. Well, do you think you would have even made this drug if you knew it would eventually cause deaths and lead to heroin addiction and deaths? He said, yes, alcohol leads to death. Yeah. And yeah. it is something that's still, that's still created. He's very nonchalant. He says that you have to have that fine line of knowing when to use it, knowing when to stop it, and knowing how much to use it. Yeah. Um, he says in life, there's many things that you can be addicted to. Unfortunately, my product is one of them. Okay. He's so, okay. Is it in the Purdue Family Farm uh, Pharma Family Soul contract to have done this, or was it mostly free will? contract to have create pain relief. Um, there was free will that took place because what was contracted was more of helping individuals. Mm -hmm. The part that free will took control over is it was it was changed into a different formula. The formula that was originally created mm -hmm. was changed. Oh really? And what was the repercussions of that change? It became more addictive or more addictive. Oh, wow. All right. So do you think looking back, you shouldn't have changed the formulation? Yes. Okay. What is the reason for this opioid epidemic? Eric, this might be one for you. What is it supposed to teach the collective? He's Eric is responding with, Mom, it's supposed to teach the collective to understand the dangers of different substances that are out there, not only opioid, but to understand the dangers and to help elderly parents, caretakers, teach these younger generations the dangers of them and what can, what can be experienced by taking something of such potency. Oh. Um, yeah. Because you're supposed to learn about the positive effects and the negative effects on the body of taking such substance. It's all about boundaries when it comes down to it and the way that you are interpreting, um, I think he's trying to say the way that you're interpreting something dangerous and the way that you're interpreting, interpreting something positive. Like it's hard to, um, translate what he's saying but it's more of interpreting something good and something bad and finding the middle in it okay this sounds reasonable so what are you guys doing you sacklers doing in the afterlife or what would you do in the afterlife to help this painkiller crisis that we have here i mean are you trying to help So Eric is standing next to him. He has a cigar lit and he says, well, we're enjoying cigars. Um, Arthur is the one that responded with that, but Eric is standing next to him and has the whole cigar. Okay. Um, they're enjoying their afterlife. They're not reminiscing on the negativity that's going on. They do feel bad about it, but okay. it's not something that holds them, holds them back. Um, they're enjoying their afterlife. So do you suppose that one of the lessons for the collective is to, to sort of learn, realize that we actually do have more power over our 
body than and, and and also the power to heal our bodies than most people think instead of becoming a, like a pain victim is that part of the lesson absolutely absolutely and developing that willpower and developing the power within yourself to have certain boundaries to say no and to say when enough is enough that I'm taking control over my life now and you gain that power back. Okay. So what are these painkillers really doing to our brain? I anyone can answer this. Eric or the Sacklers. They're having a debate. So we're going to talk about the good and we're going to talk about the bad. Okay. Um, Eric, and then we've got the two gentlemen that are talking together as well that are family members, Arthur and um, Mort what is this other fellow's name? Uh, Mortimer or Raymond? Arthur, Mortimer, Raymond. Raymond. Okay. So the good part is helping, he's referring to, this is Arthur, he's referring to people that have chronic pain, chronic illness that cannot move and have been bed bound, depleted. And when they're able to have something that's able to have them to work through that pain, what it does for the brain is it gives it life back. It helps them to move forward. It helps them to get out of bed. It helps them to take showers, to get ready and to do the daily mundane things that are needed. So that's not all bad of what this medication is doing. Oh, it's only bad when it's being misused. Um, so you, you have to look at the, the positive aspect of this medication and he's referring to just the medication and not heroin. He says, let's not oh, yeah. confuse no. the two. No, that's and, not part of the thing. Um, he says that it's two separate things and he is not, he is not supporting heroin in any way, shape or form. He is supporting his medication. Okay. And, um, it does have benefits to helping people that are chronically ill that would not be able to get up, walk, cook themselves food without having something to help them to take the pain to take the pain away. And so there's the aspect that it's helping people to live a better life than what they were previously living. Now he's talking about the negative parts of this medication. He says it's causing the brain to be programmed in a way of addiction. It's causing the brain to think that it cannot do what it needs to do without having this substance, without having this medication. In some cases, severely chronically ill, the brain will not be able to repair anyways without this medication. But in 80% of the cases, the medication is not needed and the brain is being programmed to think it needs this the support when it's not needing it. Mm. It's causing um, a different programming, a, a reprogramming, and it's making you believe that you need something that you do not need. Mm. Um, he's also talking about it's delaying the process of the way you respond, the way you interpret messages, the way you receive communication and the way you give communication, it delays that drastically. Mm -hmm. And so um, side effects, these are permanent side effects and not side effects that will be overcome over time. Mm. He's also talking about um, permanent side effects such as low low um god i can hear the word and i can't get it off it's off the tip of my tongue Endorphins? it's where you have very low energy yes okay and this is something that is something that is very long-term permanent and you have to reprogram your brain to go through therapy emotional therapy physical therapy to help reprogram your endorphins to be natural again Oh. And it's something that takes a long time and it does have permanent effects that damage you. Mm -hmm. And so you can come back to 90% of what your endorphins used to be, but 10% of that will be something that is no longer recoverable. Wow. Uh, so I think doctors have a responsibility to bear too, because you don't have to keep giving people Oxycontin. You, you can recognize that, okay, this is enough. We need to, 
wean off of it onto something slowly but surely that's less addictive. So, so why do doctors do this? So Eric was responding to your question. He's sitting down in his big black chair and it's not really big. He's sitting down in his black chair and he's like, I feel like I'm in timeout again. He's like, let's not get distracted again. That was a black timeout. Um, that's true. <laughs> he was in there a lot. He's like, mom, don't call me out. It's like, I'm trying not to get distracted. Okay, sorry. <laughs> He's over here laughing. He goes, I'm just kidding. You can call me out. It's okay. Um, doctors. He says, let's get back on track. He says, well, mom, it comes down to doctors being overloaded. Doctors do not have the answer and the automatic fix for everybody. And so their go-to is their prescription pad. Mm -hmm. When they have a client that is repetitively coming in and is in need of something, they're seeing a pattern that a client is going to benefit, a patient is going to benefit from a medication, therefore they're going to be given the medication. And so it's coming down to doctors not having enough time to analyze yeah. every single patient. And he says, I need to reiterate, reiterate, you know, the word he's trying to say, that it takes time for a doctor to diagnose somebody. You can't get a diagnosis in one visit in five visits, you need to have time with this client, with yeah. this patient, so that way you can really know what they're dealing with to really know what prescription and what, what's going to benefit them the most. And he says that's not what's taking place. But after a while, when they keep coming and, and asking for it and asking for it, a doctor should know, wait, we you've been on this for six months. We've got to reconsider. But I think a lot of doctors will say, oh, well, you know, they came in, they spent money for an office visit. They're expecting this. I got to get them what they paid for. Same thing with antibiotics. Doctors do the same thing because of that. So the antibiotics are a lot different from an opi opioid. Yeah. Um, but you're right, mom. He says you are absolutely right. And it's not all doctors. There's a lot of doctors that have a a firm foot and can put boundaries down and say, no, you you can't do this. They're able to see when it's it's becoming problematic and when the person is not needing it for pain and when they're needing it for satisfying their addiction. Addiction. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Now, why do our bodies need external medicine like painkillers or antibiotics? Well, we really don't. I mean, we can all really heal ourselves, but why? It doesn't in ninety percent of the cases you can absolutely heal yourself. He says, but mom, when you're looking at a person who has had their leg cut off and it's been it's been injured drastically, when you look at these aspects of things, there is pain. There's phantom pain and there's real pain that's being presented. These are cases that would absolutely need to have some type of medication that is as needed. And a lot of times as needed is more frequently three times a day, but it should be prescribed something as, as needed and monitored more better than what it is being yeah. monitored. Okay. But he says you can absolutely heal physical illnesses such as chronic fatigue, chronic pain, fibromyalgia, things like that that don't need to have such a toxic and potency substance being treated for those conditions. Right. Can angels be of aid to get off these substances? I mean, can you call upon the your angels, your guides, and who in the spiritual realm should be called um, to help? He says, absolutely, mom, your guides, your passed over loved ones. He says, and if you don't have anybody on the other side, a therapist, he says, if you're shouting out, a therapist can help you. He says, this can be a rehab therapist or this can be an emotional therapist. He says, a friend. It doesn't necessarily have to be a friend. He says, talk to somebody, tell somebody the problem. Don't deal with it on your own. Is there a particular Do archangel they, that would help with this sort of thing? Yes. Um, Raphael. Oh, he is the I healing like angel of, of health. Okay. And um, he says, but they're all available. 
when it comes to addiction. Okay. Uh, He's over I... here um, talking about the addiction hotline. Yeah. He says, you know, there's there's so much help and support available. You're not alone. That is. Can energy uh, medicine like scalar energy cure chronic pain and conditions like insomnia if it's not in our soul contract? And well, you know, anecdotally, I've had a lot of people, and one of the big things they realize is they don't have any pain anymore. So, yeah, I can tell you it does, but we'll confirm with the expert, Eric. Absolutely, it does. Um, scalar energy and energy healing will absolutely heal you and the way that the the energy works is it acts as a kettle a catalyst to putting you in the place that you need to be in to receive healing and 99 percent of the time it is stagnant energy yeah. and that is why a lot of people receive instantaneous healing because it removes that stagnant energy it's part of the main services removing blockages trapped emotions and all that stuff so maybe that's why even when they don't order the pain relief service, they still get relief. Uh, I'd like to know about the alleged connection between the Rockefeller Foundation, medical colleges, and the pharmaceutical industry. Is there one? They work as a collective together, partnership. To what end? Probably. All of them. Yeah. It wasn't one, it was a group of decision making. It almost reminds me of like something that's government, although this is not government. Um, it's very high up people with a lot of money. Mm. Decision making. Okay. Is it about profits? Absolutely. Okay. Gaining. Mm. When will our government government laws, lobbyists actually allow naturopathy and life-giving medications into the insurance medical system. How many years off are we from, from that? It is beginning right now. Um, he's explaining that chiropractics, mm -hmm. um, acupuncture, insurances are now, now starting to accept them. He's talking about natural doctors, Doctors that don't use pharmacy medication, he's giving this a three to five year period before insurance will be allowed. Um, and the reason for this is because there's such a there's such a crisis with a lot of patients yeah. needing needing alternatives because Western medication is not working. And so it's it's not really a choice that they have. It's a it's a must where they need to have other resources. Yeah, it's really crazy that they don't, for example, um, cover scalar peelings with or Reiki, anything like that with insurance. I mean, our, our failure rate is only 4%. That's better than antibiotics, but they cover those. So it's just crazy. Uh, have, your, I don't know, have your pharmaceutical company, Sacklers, or any other company found the cure of diseases like cancer, HIV, but are hiding it? from the public because prescription or related drugs uh, are more profitable? Yes, they have found the cure to all of them. Drugs, uh, HIV and cancer, um, terminal illnesses. He says 90% of terminal illnesses, they have a cure for it. However, we're not going to be notified. He's referring to the public. It will not be notified because it will take away from big pharma. It'll take money out of their pocket, drastic money. Yeah, and they give money to the politicians who, yeah. Okay, that's not cool. Unfortunately. Okay, we're gonna ask a couple more questions and then um, we'll stop and we'll start part two. Which prescription drug on the market now that you know should be taken off the shelves because they're detrimental to the human body? Or you, you might not have the name, but are there basically? Yes or no? There's many. What category mostly? Antibiotics, uh, pain relief, uh, analgesia? Diabetic medication. What kind? Oh, diabetic, really? Diabetic medication. Oh. Okay. <sighs> Any other category? He's not referring to the insulin that's being given. 
No, it's probably pill like, formation. Like the things like Ozempic and things, the injectables, maybe, or or like metformin, uh, pill. Metformin. Oh, okay. Wow. Pill. Okay. Okay. All right. So many people have died from the yes. use of that. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. He's talking about the dosing of the medication and the way it's being used. Mm. It's causing more damage in the end. Mm. Okay. So many people have died from the abuse of that drug, Oxycontin, especially because of the way you marketed it, Sacklers. Do you feel responsible for those deaths at all? No. He says it's free will of others that are involved in contributing to distributing the medication. Um, they are going back to oxy, oxycontin should not be taken off. However, it should be monitored more. Mm -hmm. It should be given in a period of where the patient knows they're going to have X amount of time on it. After that X amount of time, there is no more giving the prescription and tapering people off properly and making sure that they're using it accordingly. So he's both Eric and them, they're discussing why it should not be taken off the medication, medication okay. list. Okay. Uh, do you feel like there's been deceptive marketing practices by your company? 100%, yes. Well, you, so you must feel responsible for that then. He says, well, when you look at it like that, in the way that I promoted it, in the way that we promoted it, yes. He says, but again, everybody had had their own free will and had their own decision to take that action on yeah. on taking something like that. Well, if they don't truly have all this, the tools they need to make that decision because information was hidden or downplayed, et cetera, then I don't think that's fair. I mean, you know, you, free will is one thing, but you have to have the proper information. What do you say to that? Absolutely. He says, I, I agree with you. And Eric is telling him, he's like, I'm telling you right now, you're talking to a doctor. <laughs> oh, yes, and he goes, I yeah. I agree with you. He says, but it was not my my intention to cause death or harm. He still has his um, ego very connected to him. Mm -hmm. He's agreeing with you. However, he's still not taking credit. Okay. Uh, all right. So, and, and Rayleigh, and this might be good for you to answer because you are a wonderful channeler. Do you think opioid use affects the ability to channel? Absolutely. It makes it better. I don't know. I mean, what, what does it do to channeling? Any substance can affect channeling and it's, it's the way that you use it. How much you use it. Are you on the correct dosing? Are you on too low or too much? So, Absolutely, it can. Well, I mean, of course, pain can also probably hinder channeling. So I guess, it, you know, pain relief uh, to a certain degree might help if you get rid of the pain. So maybe there's a fine. Yes, and Eric, Eric is also communicating with this. And so when it comes to channeling, you want your, your body as the vehicle and how much gas do you have in your vehicle? Are you running on fumes? Are you depleted? Are you in a lot of pain? Are you exhausted? If you can't bring that up naturally, well, then you're not going to be able to channel if that's something that you're trying to achieve. And so it's very much you have to have the right, the right time to use it and the right dosing. And he says, if you take too much, you're not going to be able to work at all. Your third it's, eye? It's going it to just you. Blocks or it'll close it. It'll close it because you then become fuzzy. Taking too much of anything, you become fuzzy. You can't focus right. You can't do anything right. Okay. You, you're a fuzzball. Fuzzball sounds like something you're, Eric was saying. All right. Thank you, Raylene. Thank you, Eric. You guys, be sure you hit notification bell so you don't miss part two, which we're going to do in a second. So yeah, uh, be sure you check her out in the description box below.
Stay tuned. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.